talk about another movie that's a drama that should actually be a horror film. Last time we went over another movie that I used to think was a love story that ended tragically. And then I realized this is an abusive hobo schedule, gold digging loser who ruins her life. And I'd argue that's exactly what this story is about. Because this, this is an abusive man. And like with Blue Valentine, I was really rooting for Ryan Gosling's character and their relationship. I was so sad that she left him. Um, I was a little sad by this ending. Um, now the only thing that makes me sad is that, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen this, this is from like 15 years ago, she dies. But the thing that made me happy was him suffering forever, knowing that it's his fault. Although I doubt he'd ever admit that to himself. And since Roe v. Wade was overturned, this movie is even more horrifying. And like so many movies that I go back and watch, I can almost gauge my level of healing by how much I hate most love stories. Because this isn't love. This is literally abuse. Like so many stories, this miserable, selfish, selfish man who drank himself to death is, you know, a dark genius. It's almost always men who worship these men. He was a good writer, but he was a horrible human being. And the way that he thought of this story is very telling. It says just how horrible of a human being he is because he didn't really see women as human. He hated women. I'll get into him later on. But first, let's dig into this classic movie that made this awful man popular again and got these two actors back together what a lot of us hope would be a love story but is just abuse that's it for a movie that was directed by a man written by a man and produced by all men and then based on a story written by a terrible terrible man um i'm actually surprised that i liked this woman in this movie at all and i do believe that is solely based on kate winslet and her probably informing this character a lot because i'm pretty sure she did not play it the way yates would have wanted her to so sam mendez is trash how does a man cheat on someone? She married the director, by the way. How do you, how do you cheat on Kate Winslet? Like, uh, trash. As I go through this film, I'm going to show you all the red flags that you need to look for because this man has all of them. Red flags when you're dating and also red flags once you're actually in a relationship with these douchebags. If they're doing what Frank Wheeler does in this movie, He's an abuser. So right out of the gate, first scene, he sees this beautiful woman across the room, knows that she's too good for him, but every man always wants to date someone that they think is good, too good for them so that they actually make up for their low sense of self-worth. Which is why I warn you, never date an insecure man. They will ruin your life. So he sees this beautiful woman, goes over to her. I'm just going to call him Kate and Leo to make this easy, okay? But they're Frank and April Wheeler is their name, but it, to... Today, for simplicity, it's Leo and Kate. Right out of the gate, he asks her what she does. She wants to be an actress. She's studying to be an actress in New York City. So that alone means that she's very committed. Because to go move to New York City to be a dancer, a comedian, an actor, anything like that takes an enormous amount of courage, unless you were already born there. And ambition. This woman has ambition. This man has none. They, this is a story of a, a man who thinks way too highly of himself but is too lazy to actually do anything and ruins a woman's life in the process. What does Frank do? He's a longshoreman with the ambition of, of being cashier, I think. And like a lot of women, she's like, oh, wow. Well. Mm -hmm. And she asks him, no, 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 I don't mean what do you do for money. Like, what are you about? What do you like? Basically, what are your hopes and dreams? Like, impress me with something, bro. His answer is very telling. Honey, if I had to answer that one, I bet I'd bore us both to death in half an hour. I don't know why I'm giving Leo a southern accent. He's from Yonkers. Well, unfortunately, he made her laugh. And he's good looking. So they dance and her life is over now. Seriously, do not fall for men just because they're cute and make you laugh. Okay? Right out of the gate, this guy's like, well, I don't really have any ambition. I got nothing going for me. Hmm. Loser! She's like, oh, he's cute and he made me laugh. This will come for full circle later on. We immediately cut to him watching her do a play. 
in Connecticut, where they now live because he baby trapped her. And she still's trying to stay connected to her artistic self, despite working full time, raising two children, which men seem to think is not a job at all. Um, so she's doing this play and he's in the audience. The man hates her. He hates her because she actually has ambition and dreams and promise. And he doesn't. So when he hears people talking about how that was like not a great play, he's embarrassed for her by proxy and then goes on to punish her for embarrassing him. Even though what does he fail at? Nothing. Because he doesn't try. He's a loser. She's in the green room taking off her makeup, crying, visibly upset by how bad that play went and probably the fact that she's in this play at a public school auditorium in Connecticut rather than in New York City where she wanted to be. And what does he say to his wife to console her? Well, I guess it wasn't a triumph or anything, was it? Look how hurt she is. This man is not on her team. Like a lot of men, they don't see you as a teammate. Are You are literally here to serve them. Domestic labor, childbirth, uh and basically a full-time proper upper of his ego. And this was particularly bad in the 50s when women didn't have money and had no choice but latch, you know, uh, attach themselves to loser men who would then hijack their lives. You can already tell in this scene, not only is she hurt, but see, she's so sick of this man's crap. Your husband should be your number one cheerleader, not your number one hater and critic. So right out of the gate, I hate this man because he's jealous and insecure and because he can't look at his own failures he makes sure that she is the projection of all of his self-hatred which is why most men are miserable they hate themselves and we pay a price they can't ever ask themselves why do i hate myself so much when patriarchy tells me i'm the best thing that ever happened so instead of asking themselves why they might hate themselves they deflect and project and end up unaliving the women who end up in the same home with them. So she asks him, hey, can you please just tell the people who want to go get drinks with us that we can't. We have to get home, blah, blah, blah. He's like, I mean, don't you think that's a little rude? Can't you just pretend? God forbid I actually advocate for you and your mental health in any way whatsoever. She's like, just can you please? It should be simple enough. And honestly, what she, the subtext here is, Bro, I pretend like I don't hate you and think you're a loser every day. Can you please spare me from having to pretend anything else just for the night? And he's like, oh, whoa, whoa, take it easy. Calm down there, little lady. What are you, hysterical? Being a little dramatic, are you? And this brings us to our next red flag. I don't know. There's like five already. I'm not counting. Maybe you should count. Keep track. Because God. Hello, Gaslighter. Hello. Bird would be crazy even though I'm literally being really mean right now. Calm down for having an honest reaction to the really awful thing I just said. And I'm trying to make you do. God, I hate him so much already. I don't know how I'm going to get through this video. Okay. Humor, Melanie. Humor, humor, humor. And then comes the line. Every woman who's married a man like this has to say all the time, then I'll tell him myself. I'll do it myself. You coward i swear this is what men want us to do let's do it yourself i don't want to do anything difficult and then we have another red flag walking out of the school where she just performed in connecticut this man walks look how far ahead of her he's walking men who hate you do this i can't tell you how often men who hate you do this so immediately we get into the car with them. This is all before the opening credits, y'all. This is like the most intense opening to a movie I can remember. Immediately we cut to him being like, I mean it, baby. You were the end of person in that play. Like, you were great, but those people all suck. But he's all like backhanded compliments. Just a bunch of amateurs, blah, blah, blah. Like the dude is running his mouth. And this is another projection. Men are always saying that women talk too much. This man never shuts up. And so right out of the gate, she's like, could we please stop talking about it? She just wants to be left alone. But this man can't stop. He can't just shut up. But men always think we talk more than them when really they're the ones who are talking the most a lot of times. Not always. I'm a talker. But they perceive women to talk too much because women talking at all is usually too much. But this guy's talking has nothing to do with actually consoling her. It's about controlling her and her feelings. 
I mean, I just don't want you to feel bad about it, that's all. Because any feeling other than, oh my god, you're the best, Frank, makes me feel uncomfortable. So, cheer up, bitch! Again, she's like, can we please stop talking? So, uh, Leo's character will not shut up. This woman literally asks him like three or four times, please stop talking. And he's like, no, I mean, it's like, like, whatever. These people are like not good enough for you. I like basically trying to talk her out of just acting in general. That's what it's really about. I want you to feel better so that I'm not uncomfortable. But at the end of the day, I also want you to stop doing something you love because I hate my life and I want you to hate yours too, Berg. So, um, and then he, this is the, this is like the theme. One of the major themes of this movie is that like, I mean, it's bad enough. We have to live amongst these people. This man thinks that he is better. They both do. But she actually had ambition and he didn't. But this man is full of so much audacity. Even though he hates himself, he is so cocky. Which is always because of low self-esteem, by the way. And his just delusion that he is the prize even though he hates himself. That is what so many men are struggling with. They are like being told that they deserve the world. They deserve a beautiful wife. They deserve everything with as little effort as possible. They deserve all this stuff, but they hate themselves and they just can't, they just can't make those two make sense. Now, Yates, the guy who wrote this, wants us to think that both of these two are losers and overestimate their talents, but I'm going to prove in this video um, that this woman actually probably had talent. She actually wanted to do things. She was very motivated. She's very smart. This man did not. He ruined her life. And because of patriarchy and no birth control and ab abortion being illegal, he used all the tools of the patriarchy and his own self-hatred to literally unalive her. And so if you take nothing else away from this video, if you don't watch the whole thing, please leave with this. When men are talking about how our grandmas were just so happy, 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 and we should want to go back to the traditional marriage, this is what they're talking about. But this is the reality. Most of our grandmas were being held hostage by our grandpas. Our grandpas hated our grandmas and our grandpas malls hated our grandpas. But the grandpas wouldn't let us go. We didn't let grandma go. So grandma did whatever she could to make peace with being a hostage. That is what these men want. Hostages. Do not buy the trad wife crap. This is what it's really about. But our grandmas just didn't tell us. Some of them did. Thank you very much. But most of them have kept this dirty, dirty secrets of grandpa. Or actually unalive grandpa. <laughs> that actually happened a lot. We don't talk about that though. So when Kate's character, I'm just gonna call her Kate. When Kate, maybe the fifth time she asks him to shut up, she try. could you just stop talking about it? You're gonna drive me crazy, please. And this man, doesn't like to be challenged. And this is where little baby abuser comes out. He's got to put her in her place. How dare her talk back? The hostage should never talk to the captor that way. I don't bite the hand that feeds you, baby. So he pulls the car over. April, sweetheart, let's talk about this. And she's like, oh my God, stop. He tries to touch her. She says, don't touch me. She then asks him, please leave me alone. And he says, you know, it strikes me there's a considerable amount of BS going here, going on here. And then he proceeds to say the most ridiculous crap ever. He's like, I'm going to give you a list of all the ways you're wrong and I'm gaslighting you. Number one, it's not my fault. The play was lousy. She never told him it was his fault. She just doesn't want to talk about it. Although we now know that he thinks the play's lousy, including her. Number two, it's not my fault that you didn't turn out to be an actress. Actually, it is. You baby trapped her and made her move to Connecticut away from the heart of the artist's and actor's whole life. So that is your fault, Frank. Number three, it's not my fault that I will not pretend to be a dumb, insensitive suburban husband. No, you don't have to pretend. You just are a dumb, insensitive husband who dragged your wife into the suburb. And how dare you lay that title over me? And then right as he gets to number four, granted, I'm not going to go this slow through the rest of the movie. 
But the opening credits have not even started yet. And this man is is literally the worst. So he's like, number four. And then she's like, oh my God, I gotta get out. She literally runs away, gets out of the car. What are you doing? Come back here so I can continue to talk down to you and insult you. You better listen to me because I need you to feel a different way. And ah. Now, this is really funny because, again, she's like, I just need a minute. Let me stand here for a second. Smoke my cigarette. Just have a minute of quiet. Do y'all remember when I did Blue Valentine? Okay, the picture's weird. This is literally the same thing that happened. Ryan Gosling wouldn't shut up, wouldn't stop being a king baby emotional abuser. And she literally ran out of the car and went to the woods and was like, oh my God, just get me away from him. All of this is abuse. And if your partner does this to you, you are being abused. He may never lay a hand on you, but he's literally punching you in your heart and your soul and your spirit all the time and unaliving you through your nervous system, by the way. So he literally is just like, can't we talk? She's like, I don't want to talk. Can't we talk? I don't want to talk. Please leave me alone. And then finally he's like, I don't deserve this. Remember we talked about reactive abuse? I don't like that term, but this is how, this is Darvo, y'all. He's like, you're abusing me. How can you do this to me? And he's the one who has actually started all this. I don't deserve this. And she's like, I love how you are just so clear about what you do and don't deserve. I love this line. This woman has a lot of great lines. Basically calling him a king baby, entitled, selfish, without ever actually saying those words. Okay, so he spends the next couple minutes being like, you twist everything, you blame me for everything. Literally just gas, I gas, I gas, I gas, like. And finally she was like, I just wish you'd stayed home tonight. And this is actually how it, how it worked when you were married to a man who is not your number one cheerleader, but is instead your number one hater. She probably would have done well in that play if she didn't know her husband was in the audience actively hating her and hoping that she would do bad. So he points in her face, you're sick, you're sick, you're twisted little woman, blah. She finally fights back and she's like, oh yeah, you know what you are. Oh, I love this. Watch out. She she calls him disgusting. She's like, you think you can bully me, me into feeling whatever you want me to feel. But you're a pathetic, self-deluded little boy. Look at you. Ah! Uh, you think you can bully me be just because you've got me safely in this little trap. Remember I told y'all men love obtaining women out of their league, collecting them like exotic birds. I don't remember who made this metaphor. Please give them credit if you know. But I've never unheard that. Literally like that one and then put them in a cage. That is literally what the 50s was. Actually, that's what patriarchy is. What am I talking about? Baby trapped, financially trapped, trapped physically because a lot of these women are too afraid to leave these men like trap 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 that's what these men want they don't want us to be able to leave that's why they don't want us to have jobs that's why they don't want us to have financial freedom that i've told y'all before my ex literally said i wish you hadn't gotten that iud now you can just leave baby trap all the traps and then he laughs like you in a trap you and like alluding to the fact that he's the man trapped with this wife he hates because he's jealous of her and these kids he hates even though he literally made her have them. Men are, who hate their jobs and their lives will literally trap women so that those women can then be on the receiving end of the abuse because they get abused at work or whatever. They get abused by capitalism. They come home and they, <clears throat> how dare you? I'm the victim and you will pay for my cowardice. And just to show you how much men are so threatened by the idea of not being a man, when you call them a king baby or a little boy, they're like, no, I'm not, I'm not. Cause she was like, you call yourself a man? Yeah, baby, and I'm gonna remind you that I'm a man. I'm going to pretend to punch you, to scare you back into submission, lest you forget I may be a baby but I'm a king baby and I could literally take your life. But instead, cause you know, he's a good guy. He loves his wife. He, uh, just like Matt Damon in Goodwill Hunting, fork that guy, that man's abusive. Anyway, he punches the car really hard instead because the threat of violence is how men keep you in line. And this scene is him telling you, her, I want to hit you. And if I could legally get away with it or get away with it without the neighbors wondering, I would do it. But 
I'm not going to. And that's a choice he makes. And just in case anyone doesn't know that this man does not have a temper at work or with the woman he's cheating on her with or with anybody, he can emotionally regulate. He is purposely not. These men absolutely can control themselves. They pretend not to in order to justify being abusers. Look what you made me do. So right after Leo threatens her with violence, pretending to punch her, and then he's all sad. Don't look at me like that, April. Don't look at me like I'm the bad man that I actually know I am. And she's like, can we just go home? That's another way of saying, if you just shut up. This could be over. And then we cut to the opening credits. Like, holy crap. But that the reason why I went into all that is that the entire relationship is that. that the, 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 and the thing is, is that I was just like, the first time I saw this movie, I was like, oh my God, don't be so mean to him. It's Leo. And again, I'm thinking of these two. And in this movie, he was a very supportive partner and she was the main character energy. And then they killed him off, which I think was the best thing they could have done. Because this little hobo probably would have ruined her life. I don't know. Maybe not. But I love that, you know, he showed up to teach her a lesson and help her understand her worth and get out of that terrible relationship. And then she went on to live the best life ever. Like, that is how most people write women. We are just the people who are supposed to teach men lessons so that they can go on and lead their best life. So I think that's why so many women love this movie. They're like, wow, this guy, like, actually did something not selfish. And the whole story is really about her. So I went into this movie thinking, yeah, yeah, Kate and Leo. No. Like, this is the non-rich version of um, the Titanic if she had ended up with Cal. But Cal was like a gold digging hobo. So then we cut to his life going back to the city because men get to go back to the city and live their little double life where they cheat with the the secretary and go out. This, this is literally like mad men. It's horrifying. And then she's stuck at home taking care of kids in Connecticut. Doing dishes, taking out the trash, taking care of kids, cleaning up baby puke and all kinds of stuff. She is understandably not happy she wanted to be an actress so then we get to leo's workplace and we find out right away that he's a loser at work too he's a loser as a husband he's a loser at life and he also doesn't do a good job and gets reprimanded right away and the reason why he's a loser at work is because he doesn't even know what he's doing he says i don't even know what this is he also admits to doing the least amount of work possible That checks out. That's what you do at home. That's what you do at work. You're a lazy, entitled, king baby piece of crap. Um, And because you know you don't deserve any of the things that you get, what does he do? Besides show off to the other men at work, he terrorizes women at work. Creates a lot of work for this woman. Just as an excuse, get her alone and make her come to lunch with him so he can cheat on his wife with her. Which is another example of how men who are insecure and hate themselves literally use women for literally everything, including feeling like a big boy. He does you know, he just got reprimanded by boss. What am I going to do? Well, my wife's not here to threaten to beat her. So I'm going to go and cheat on her and ruin this woman's day. But like every insecure man who's full of hubris, he takes his lady to lunch and is like, you know, you're lucky you met me. Because again, men need women to validate them when they feel bad about themselves. He takes his poor secretary to to lunch, tells her he's going to show her the ropes, tells her like what a big boy he is at work. So he has the dude bring a phone over to him, calls her boss and is like, yeah, I'm having her work on some stuff. Um, She's going to need the whole rest of the afternoon off to work for me. And she's like, oh my God, because this is how we've been conditioned, right? Like she could just be acting here because women, we know we have to do this crap. But also we've been taught that like, oh my God, it's a man. He must know so much. And because she's young and doesn't live with this nightmare of a man, she's like, wow. While Leo's having his little fair. This is, I swear, they've messed with us so much, y'all. They're like, hey, you want a Titanic reunion? We'll even bring this woman back, Kathy Bates. Although she plays a very different character in this movie. Holy crap. So she's the neighbor who also like sold them this house or whatever. And she's over there talking to his wife being like, hey, I've got like my son. He's a little crazy. And you guys are just an extraordinary couple. Can you hang out with this guy? Now, this scene isn't worth talking about other than the fact that if you want to, like, you understand the emptiness of whiteness. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, that's okay. I talk about it a lot. But whiteness in the United States was literally created um, to 
make sure that white supremacy and anti-blackness and, you know, all the found, the foundation of our history is genocide and chattel slavery. And so whiteness was created to make all the people who moved to the U.S. who are white, all of the colonizers, all of the immigrants, literally everybody, become dead inside and just have the silent violence of this crap. The fa- These people can't even talk to each other. They're just like, mm. Uh, this isn't this is about capitalism this is about patriarchy but this is about whiteness too and how empty and dead it is which is another reason why the quicker white people get on board to let go of our power the happier we all will be uh because we also won't be oppressing people and literally unaliving them but also because this is a miserable existence and this movie so well captures the emptiness of whiteness and feeling dead inside in order to conform and play the game and have power and it ain't worth it baby you take this and you multiply it by 15 and that's what it's like in the south (laughs) while literally full of rage and then white women taking that rage out on anyone we have power over especially the black community which i would argue is one way we get karens anyway that's another video god this scene is like But this asshat who doesn't understand patriarchy and how it makes men dead inside and doesn't understand whiteness and how it makes white people dead inside in order to oppress people, he's like, this is just like America. This is America in the suburbs. And like, it's just not fair and it sucks. Dude, I really wish you had worked on yourself instead of drinking all the time to avoid working on yourself because you literally were so close to the point and you missed it. Then we cut back to Leo who is basically schmegly harassing the secretary and he's like it's my birthday i'm a big boy i'm dirty today and i hate myself so in addition to having to fork this dude she also does a whole lot of emotional labor she has to listen to him talk about his daddy how his daddy was such a loser and how he swore he'd never end up like his dad and now he is and this if you could also summarize this movie besides all the things i've already said it Man who hate I me mean, when you I'm gonna tell you all about this the the writer's uh m- mother's r- relationship with his mom it explains so much but also with his dad was did didn't feel loved by daddy was ashamed of daddy was neglected by daddy and then literally becomes daddy incarnate but worse men who hate their dads who don't deal with hating their dads and their moms literally become their dads sometimes worse than their dad but he thinks he's better. <laughs> But by this point, he has gotten this woman so drunk, I'd argue what he did was great. Besides schmegel harassment and the abuse of power, because he's basically her boss, which in and of itself is coercion, he also got her so drunk that she's like, I can't even focus on what you're saying. So while he's in her apartment, he's like, well, I guess that wasn't what you had in mind when you woke up this morning, getting graped by your boss. (laughs) No, really, he's basically blaming it all on her. You little slut bag. That's basically what he's doing in this scene. Like, oh, were you planning on doing this today? Mm -hmm. She's so uncomfortable and feels obviously a little embarrassed because she's probably sobering up now and being like, how did that happen? You were graped, honey. If you can't even focus on his face when you're talking, you can't consent. This man is not only an abuser, he's a grapist. Marital grapist too, by the way. They don't show those scenes, but they imply it. But he's like, well, listen, you were swell. Like, God, this guy's the worst. Take care now. Like, honestly, if I were her, I'd be like, um, am I going to get fired? No. No, because he needs to keep you around so he can continue to cheat. So then he comes home from cheating and his wife is all dressed up in a beautiful dress. And she's like, I'm sorry I missed you all day. Um, I'm sorry. And she's got his children that he trapped her into having. Um, and a cake and her, the good wife. Singing happy birthday to Big Dad, the big man of the house. And he's almost in tears because he knows he doesn't deserve this. And then he takes a shower to wipe that other woman off of him. Because now he's expecting his wife to to fork him too. This next scene is so painful because she has realized she's going to die in this house. Maybe she can convince him to be the man that he said he was. Back when he was, you know, trying to win her over, I'm sure he told her a whole lot of lies. Because he apparently talked about Paris and how amazing it was. So that she would feel like, you know, she hasn't really lived life. When really, he was in Paris because he had fought in the war. But he hung it over her head like, I'm this really adventurous, exciting guy. And she's like, I know. Let's go back to the place. You always said it was the only place you'd ever been. 
that you'd want to go back to the only place worth living. Let's go there. Get me out of the suburb. And then she did what so many wives do. Builds up her man. Says all these things. When I first met you, you were... There was nothing in the world that you couldn't do or be. Yeah, because that was all like false bravado, bro. That's not who he is. He's a coward. She was like trying so hard to hang on to this idea that she didn't marry a loser. Right before this scene, while Leo was having an affair with his secretary, they did a, a, a flashback to when they were young and dating. And this guy sold her on a lie, showing her pictures of going to Paris. And he's like, she's like, oh my God, have you been to Paris? she admits that she's never really been anywhere and like a lot of women she has a lot of ambitions she has a lot of dreams but because women haven't been conditioned to figure out our dreams and go for those dreams ourselves and because women back then didn't have birth control couldn't get abortions legally couldn't really have bank accounts or anything like we can now they really had to hitch their wagon to a man who might help them fulfill their purpose, their dreams. And she stupidly thought that Leo would do that because that's what he sold her at. Even like, yeah, I'm going to go back there. And maybe I'll take you with me. Honestly, that's probably why she was like, okay, I could see a life with this man. He's special, even though he doesn't have much ambition. And this is yet another thing that women have been conditioned to do, which is to um, marry potential rather than facts. He even says crap like this. I'm going to go back the first chance I get, I tell ya. People are alive there. Not like here. Look at his face. He is so smug. Like so many women, she was like, wow. Um, by the way, men lie. They lie to themselves. They lie to us. We really got to stop believing the crap that comes out of their mouth and watch what they do. Because apparently she had called him out on his ambition because right after that he's like, so how's that for ambition? I'm going to go to Paris. I'm going to bring you to. And this is one of the things that men do. They study you. They figure out what it is that's important to you. And as soon as they narrow in on it, or at least the men who are just whatever, predatory, narcissist, abuser, liar, blah, blah, blah. He, no, he knew that ambition and having like a, like hobbies and a passion and a hunger for life and living life and not settling was really important to her. So remember that first conversation? She was like, I don't, no, 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 what, not what your job is. What do you do? What do you want to do? And he couldn't answer that question. And now, I don't know how much longer this was. This was during their dating time. He, was, he has realized that he's got to sell her this lie that he has all this ambition and he's got these dreams. And that is the main point of this whole movie, which the author himself seems to have missed because he was blinded by patriarchy, is that it's not that she was not special in lying to herself. It was that she had no power. She didn't have many options. Just being a woman, even though she's a white woman with lots of privilege, she doesn't have options to have agency over her life in a lot of ways that women do now. So she basically deluded herself into thinking because he lied that her husband was a man that he absolutely was not. Look at what she says to him. I think you're the most interesting person I've ever met. That's all based on the lies that he just said, like, I want to go to Paris. I'm going to take you to Paris, blah, blah, blah. So she really creates this whole dream in her head of who this man is, what her future holds. You know, she's got her acting and stuff like that, but she obviously wants other things too, like to travel and experience new things. And this guy is not that person. He sold himself as that person like so many men do, but that's not who he is. He literally did this like so many men, just lied to get the girl. And then as soon as they're married, he's done growing. He doesn't want to change. He's he's crossed the finish line. And uh, their, mo their marriage, like a lot of marriages, the finish line for him and the funeral for her. The starting line for an, an endless labor and compromise. So, so then they cut back to this conversation where she's trying to sell it on this idea of going to Paris. She's like, look, I'll work. She's already been looking into this. They pay really good uh, secretary jobs. And, like, she's got it all figured out. And she basically is making a sales pitch to him. His gaslighting ass is like, he's like, what's stopping us? And he's like, really? Like, he's such a naysayer. He's like, look at the way he looks down at her. Like, you are so silly, you silly little woman. For one thing, what are we going to do then? This whole scene is, is mind-blowing. Because remember, this was like back in the 50s. So the fact that she is... Even willing to do this and even convinces him of this is pretty incredible. 
But she's like, ah, oh, you'll be doing what you should have been allowed to do seven years ago. And she basically sells this whole thing because, again, she can't have ambition and dreams. It's all got to be about him and pumping up his ego. And she gifts him with the opportunity to do nothing for six whole months. She, They have savings. She's already figured out what they would get for the house and all this stuff. Plus, they're saving because she's probably really smart with money and he isn't like most men. She's got the whole plan figured out. She's going to buy him the gift of time. She will go to work and give him six months to literally read, take, you know, draw, paint, whatever it is to figure out what he is meant to do, what his sense of purpose is, because she believes he, he is too smart to be working this dumb job. Little does she know he isn't actually. He's a loser. He probably could. He has potential, but he has, he's a coward. And that's really what it comes down to. So many men are cowards. Their egos are too big that they, they don't even want to try anything. God, God forbid they fail at something and they have to deal with the shame of failure. So they won't try at all. And instead, he just keeps arguing with her. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. Because he's afraid. So she keeps at it, trying to build up his ego, being like, no, you're amazing. Something, by the way, that this man has never done for her. Uh prime example the opening scene when she is um acting at her play and he's like you suck oh like it's unrealistic blah and she's like no it's unrealistic for a man with a fine mind fine mind to go on working at a job he's too good for this is this is so frustrating because this is what so many women do they pump up their man we have been taught to be their cheerleaders now Granted, back in the day of our grandmas who were hostages, that's what they had to do. They had to pump up the ego of their man so that he would actually go on to do good things instead of settling for crap. Because she believes in him. She's his cheerleader. This is why I cannot stand of some of the, re one of the reasons, the whole, you know, Taylor Swift football do. It's, go it's just another example of a woman doing so much to cheer on her man. Yeah, you can do it. You can do it. Uh, well, he does the bare minimum to cheer her on. Anyway, I've already covered this topic. If you say some BS, I've already talked about all this. Even a billionaire woman is acting like a woman from the 50s being like, yay, you're the best. I'll fly 9,000 miles to go cheer you on. You'll get praised as a good guy for flying and seeing me once. She tells him it's ridiculous to work a job you can't stand. And then come home to a place you can't stand. To a wife that can't stand any of this stuff either. And she even calls out the fact that their whole existence in this town is on the premise that they were actually too good for this. And they are meant for other things. And they are outliers. Blah, blah, blah. I actually believe she's an outlier. But she married a man who is a basic. And so she will never meet her potential because she's being weighed down by a ball and chain loser who doesn't want to do anything to better his life. She is settling for a settler, thus ruining her own life. But then again, how many choices did women back then really have? She goes on to say, we are bought, we've bought into the whole delusion that our life has to end as soon as we have kids. We just have to conform. Who made these rules? We can make our own rules. And she's really rebellious in the way she thinks. But unfortunately, she's with a naysayer. Traditional man hates himself, thus wants uh, her to be miserable too. Now, this is very telling. You really need to pay attention to men. He was like, I mean, but whoever said that I was really meant to be a big deal? You, bro. You, your smug butt, literally convinced this woman that you are meant to be a big deal, but you know you're not. So now that she's calling you on that and holding you accountable and challenging you to step up to this man that you sold yourself as, he's like, no, 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 but I think he ever said I'm supposed to be a big deal. You, uh, liar. And then she's like, no, 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 no. When I first met you, there was nothing in the world you couldn't do or be. And he's like, Crap, did I say that? Even says this, y'all. When you first met me, I was a little wise guy. Like, he's trying to say, honey, I was full of crap. I can't believe you fell for this, you dummy. Even though I literally lied to you and it's my fault. You silly puss. A wise guy with a big mouth. That's all. <laughs> Yo, listen to men when they say this. When they say you're too good for me, believe them. Look at her. She's like trying so hard to believe the lies he told her in her own delusion. No, you weren't. How can you even say that? Honestly, I believe that she even knows 
that this is true. And she's hope like what else is she gonna do? So she's like, crap, I gotta convince this man that he is more than a loser. How do I do it? How do I do it? No, I know. Women are so good at manipulating men for survival. Like, no, 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 no. But like, if I was like a writer, I had talent, it'd be one thing, but uh, no. Like, no, it's, it's what you are that's being stifled. She's just like, it's, it's what you are that's being denied. And denied in this kind of life. God, she's good, y'all. Have you had to do this for a man before? I have. And it's tiring. Trying to convince a man to believe in himself is really tiring if he never does that for you. Obviously. The good thing about being in a partnership versus a marriage, you, a marriage can be a partnership. For most men, it's not. It's like, they're not on your team. <clears throat> they're competing with you. And, or you're the, yeah, you're the opponent. But for a, a healthy marriage, you're both supposed to have your own level of natural, like normal self-doubt. And then, of course, if you have patriarchy, also, then you really have self-doubt. And if your husband actually believes in you, and is your number one fan, he will be doing this, which all that, that she's doing, he'll be doing that for you. And then you can do that for him. It is, it's, you are each other's biggest fan. But that is not what's happening here. This man's her hater. She's his cheerleader. And this scene is exhausting. Like, look at this. You're the most beautiful, wonderful thing in the world. Look at it. He's like, you really think so? Oh, because I hate myself. And this is my favorite part right here. Because she uses this line to build him up or tear him down because she realizes she's dealing with a very toxically masculine, insecure man who she can literally take a bat to his knees by threatening his manhood. But she can also pump him up and get what she wants and needs because, again, she has very little power by saying, you're a man. He doesn't get any better than that. You're. A man. He's like, yeah, I'm a man. Okay, let's go to Paris. Y'all, women are so good. And I know a lot of cultures are like this, but white women in the South are so good at this. You're a man. You're such a big boy. Now give me a little money so we can pay our bills. And their final words are, "Is this, this is our chance, our one chance. Now this is so good. This is a perfect example of why men need us so much because all it takes is a little speech by his wife. And this man goes into work the next day being like whistling and like doing that. I don't know, there's like a whole meme of him just being like, I'm the happiest dude in the world. He's like so smug, like sweating confidence. And he secretly knows the only reason why he has any v sense of self-worth is because of his wife. And she can take it away like that. And then all he does is threaten violence. And then she, you know, changes her tune. So because everything that men do is to impress women and therefore impress men, because when you get the girl, then, you know, men just want the approval of men so bad. He's like, hey guys, guess what? I'm going to Paris. And his little bow tie work husband's all like, yeah, right, bro, and I'm going to Tangier. Which is also another point. Men are other men's biggest haters. They literally don't want other men to thrive because then that will make them feel worse about themselves. And that's why men need to stop taking advice from men. Because his wife pumped him up to being like, I'm the man. And then his buddies are like, no, you're not. And he's like, no, I am. Because my wife knows I am. And even at lunch, you're all like, I mean, come on. Like, do you really need to go to Paris to figure out who you are? Can't you just do that here? And he's like, uh, I don't think I can discover anything here like you loser. And I don't think you can either. Like, he is so smug. Because again, his whole thing is that he thinks that he's better than everybody, but secretly knows he's worse than everybody. And he just can't work this out. So he is just constantly a walking contradiction. Meanwhile, because Umbertures gets stuff done, she is already like at the embassy, like getting, my guess is she has been researching this for a long time because we just see her like with tickets and like everything's all set up. She is ready to go. Again, this woman has ambition but it is followed with action because women know if you want to get stuff done, you actually have to do something. Whereas men who are more entitled and have just had the world handed to them, even, I mean, especially rich men, but even, you know, a lot of men who are struggling, they still get things handed to them just for being men. 
just for being men. Whereas women usually know. Not all women, okay? But women usually know if they want something to get done, they have to do it themselves. Whereas men, a lot of them don't think that way. They just want to like, like Frank is at his job. He's getting paid and he's like literally admits he doesn't know what he's doing and he's trying to do the least possible to fool everyone into thinking that he knows. Like, uh, no shame. Okay, so then we cut to the neighbors. And yes, that is the guy from Stranger Things. I can't believe I did not realize that's who that was until I was like, God, I've seen that guy before. It's this movie. I stopped watching Stranger Things a long time ago, but definitely won't be watching it now. It was Brett Gilman and that other dude. <laughs> but look at this scene. His wife is like trying to get all pretty. And he's like, is that what you're wearing? This is another example of an entitled man who has this beautiful wife. She's like too good for him. And he treats her like crap. He can't stand her. Hurts her feelings all the time. And then he's like, okay, uh, anyway. Go somewhere to get her. And she's like, <laughs> this woman's character is so painful to watch. And Kathy Bates' character. Also, like, this is literally like WandaVision part one. Look at, she just, just, it's just, I, I am so sad for the women in this film. All they do is pretend. Because everything hinges on the ego of the men that they have to live with. Because as soon as he walks away, she's like... And then they show a scene of this guy walking in to be like, Hey guys, like his kid, who he probably ignores just like Frank does. And they're just watching TV and they're like, mm hmm They don't even say hi to him. They don't even answer when he's like, what are you watching? But my guess is they ignore him because he's literally never there. Doesn't treat his wife with respect and probably hates his children as much as his wife and blames them and resents them for him being miserable when really this is what happens when entitled lazy men get everything they want without having to actually work hard to keep them and they lie to get those things then they start to resent the very people who go along with the lie that is really what this movie is about. Now the writer thinks it's two people fooling themselves, but the writer obviously also hated feminism and thought it was a bunch of crap and hated his mom. So really, without even realizing the point that he made in this story, and granted this was probably changed a lot by the people who adapted this screenplay, is that all of these men hate their wives and their lives and the women are stuck. And they're stuck performing for these men because they'll die if these men get angry they'll financially ruin them so they have to keep up the act all the time and play house and pretend to love these men and literally have schmegs with men they can't stand so that they don't die of starvation and these men hate their wives for it men could be happy they could experience love, but they just won't let go of power. And so they're miserable and they want us to be miserable. And this is what these men, these red pill dudes are like, I want a trad wife so I can be this guy. You don't want to be this, this guy. Believe me. You can tell right away that this man is not in love with his wife, but is it actually in love with the neighbor? Why? Because men who get things they don't work hard for, they want other things. If you don't appreciate your wife and resent her for putting up with your BS, then all you want is the thing you can't have. The wheeler. The hot guy's wife. Look at the way he looks at her. We never once see him look at his own wife that way. Definitely not his kids. Men want what they can't have when they're given things that they don't deserve. So when they tell this couple, their neighbors, their whole plan to leave, he's like, yeah, but what are you going to do, Frank? I know this is off, obviously rooted in a lot of toxic masculinity and patriarchal conditioning like the man has to be the breadwinner. But now that I've dated a hobo schedule, um gold digger and realized that most men are literally gold digger, I actually like this because the only thing Frank has to do is bring home the bacon and now he doesn't even have to do that and he's all like I'm gonna study and read and figure out what I want to do and figure out you know what I'm meant to do with my life unlike you you loser and old Sheppy boy's all like well she supports you bro <laughs> I love that like literally like all you have to do is make money that's all you literally have to do is pay bills and like you're not even gonna do that that's weird you know what Shep that is weird and this is actually where we're at now whereas before at least men had to bring home money but now they're like you know what I'm gonna sit at home do nothing you do everything and also support me so I can figure out what I want to do 
And for most men, that is literally watch video games or play video games and fork off. And then he's all like, no, 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 just in the beginning. Besides, the cost of living in Paris is dirt cheap. Uh -huh. What are y'all talking about? Uh, the people I know in Paris are living in shoeboxes. And I'm even comparing that to New York. Like, what? Delulu. Look, she's like, these people are crazy. But like a white woman. Oh my God, I think that sounds great. Okay, sorry for the wardrobe change, y'all. I had to take a break. But after this whole conversation, the neighbor's WandaVision lady is a little upset. And her husband is like, you know what? I think this whole thing is really immature. She's like, oh my God, I'm so relieved that he's on the same page as her. Does this lady knows that she's trapped? And when people who take chances, couples who are really in love, anybody who's kind of like not doing the um, typical thing that capitalism wants of us, <laughs> which is to be dead inside. That is very threatening to people, right? So she's just like, oh, thank God. And she is trapped and she knows it. So she's like, oh, at least he is like on board with it. She's like, oh, I was thinking that the whole time. And then again, he's like, I mean, what kind of man is going to sit around and in his bathroom all day picking his nose while his wife goes out and works? And she's like, I don't know. And they like bond over this. Um, agreement that it's weird that, that, you know, Kate Winslet's character, April or whatever, is going to work really hard so Frank, her trash husband, can just sit around and figure it out. So then she starts crying and he's like, why are you crying? It's nothing, I just read. And then she keeps crying and he's like, God, please stop crying. And this is like a reminder of, even though they're on the same page, this man doesn't even like her. And he's just so annoyed, like so many men, that women dare to have a feeling about anything. And she, that when, they're jealous that women don't hide all their feelings. Again, everything comes down to jealousy. God, why don't you just pretend like you don't care about things like me? I can't access my heart because it's frozen. Why don't you freeze yours too? So then the wheelers go back, bond over how much they shocked these people. And so this this couple now is in the like us versus the world. They are teammates. For this brief moment of time, they are teammates instead of enemies. By enemies, him actively sabotaging her entire life um, and her being resentful that <laughs> she's stuck with this dude. So the next scene, um, talking about work, and she's like, I would have loved to see the look on the face when you told your boss you're leaving. And he's like, <laughs> And avoid, uh, basically this, again, we're going to, the rest of this whole uh, recap is showing, how, I have already done it too, how much men lie. They lie and lie and lie and lie, lie through omission. Sometimes they outright lie with so much audacity, but they just lie through omission, through misleading us, through vague answers, through avoiding things. So then this really intense scene happens. Kathy Bates' character, who is also like just as scary as the WandaVision lady, is like, hey, hey. She brings over her son, who, you know, Kate Winslet had agreed to let come over because they're the only interesting couple in town. And this dude, like Michael Shannon, I think that's his name. He's a really good actor. I don't know anything about his personal life. I just assume every man in Hollywood is trash um, because they usually treat their women in their lives that way. Anyway, he might be, I don't know anything about him, but his character in this movie, I really love because this is the truth teller. This is the dude who just literally says everything that no one in this white, um, silent, um, dead inside society will say. But I don't like how much he hates his mom. I understand frustration with her ruse and like, mm, but bro, you are still a man. He asks Frank about his job and he's like, well, it's actually really stupid. There's nothing interesting about it at all. Because now that he is in a different era, he's not afraid to say these things out loud because he is under the impression that he's different and he's special and he's leaving thanks to his wife. And then he's like, well, why do you do it? Wait, let me guess. You got to play house and have a job. She don't like, and he's like, yeah, 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 but we're leaving. She's like, we're getting out of here. And then he's like, how do you feel about mom? She's like, oh God, no, this is what I mean. Everyone is threatened by people who are not staying in line. And them going to Paris and her working is not her being a woman. And these are the women who are the foot soldiers of patriarchy. 
She's censoring men. She's doing her job. Why won't this Kate Winslet lady do it? Such different roles than Titanic, let me tell you. So then they go for a walk with this Mi Michael dude. I don't know his real name, I forget. Who had been in electric shock treatment, which is a nice reminder that during this time, anyone with any anything they considered like a mental illness they literally tortured them and i say that as uh, my father was in the mental institution um and one flew was a cuckoo's nest they did this to anyone in mental institutions but guess who they usually call crazy the most women and also anybody who's not following the rules which means anyone who's in any marginalized community especially and so you know now for a split second in time leo is a truth teller he was like, he's like, why are you running to Paris? Running away. He's like, well, we're running away from the hopeless emptiness <laughs> of this life. He's like, wow, good for you. No one ever says it out loud, but that's what it is. And again, they're bonding over their shared dream, their shared goal, being on the same team, finally. She's like, you know, if this is what being crazy is, then I'd rather be insane than live a lie. And she's like, I love you so much. The reason why I'm including this scene is because... You know, they hated each other so much for most of this movie. But the one moment in time where we actually see her, that she actually loves this man, it's only when she's in the delusion that he is the person he promised he was. This is a brief moment where she actually believes she hasn't been tricked and trapped and held hostage by a loser with no ambition and no courage. So then... Leo, the next day, gets offered a job by the big boss, like the big, big boss, the boss of his boss. He's like, you're not the average salesman. The only reason why Leo is doing a good job now is because he doesn't care. Like, so he's just, he's being braver because he has nothing to lose, which again is thanks to his wife. Oh, and he's also not having an affairs for this brief moment of time. So he's actually doing his job instead of pretending to work while forking the secretaries. Like... And this man knows how to work Leo's ego. Men are so good at giving men terrible advice and playing on their insecurities to get them to do what they want. I mean, I know that women are really good at that because we had to, but men are so good at this. It's like, if you want to be something, be a part of something, you're exceptional. It'll be more money. I mean, okay, more time. So like, what's the point, bro? He already works 10 hour day. And then Frank, sorry, Leo, is like, do you remember my dad? <laughs> Yeah, I was like, no, even though he'd worked there for 20 years. And he's like, didn't think so. There's no reason you to remember him. And he's like, okay, so I appreciate the offer, but um, I'm actually leaving. But then this guy works his magic. He knows that Leo's got some serious daddy issues and is an insecure man who makes decisions based off his ego. And so he's like, you know what? Let me tell you something my father told me. Because everything is about daddy, daddy, daddy when it comes to men. I mean, in terms of them, like, just, like, can't get over the fact their dads didn't love them and they'll do anything to prove that they're better than their dads because they hate their dads. Not all of them. But you wouldn't believe how many. Man only gets a couple chances in life. If he doesn't grab him by the ball, it won't be long before he's sitting around wondering how he became second rate. The subtext is, if you don't take this offer, you're going to be like your dad. So before you ruin your life and become like your dad, why don't you sleep on it, buddy? Look at his face now. He's not so cocky anymore. He's like, oh crap, I am my dad. He's like, discuss it with your wife. Because let's be honest, where the hell would any of us be without our wives, right? Am I right? Of course, they'll never say that to their actual wife. Then the final nail in the coffin is just think about it. It'd be a fine memorial to your dad. Literally, I swear to God, men, men's daddy issues know no bounds. He's just like, ugh. Like he literally changes his mind. Like he was already leaning that way because he's a coward. But all it took is one man who's proud of him because daddy wasn't. One man who's not a loser like daddy. And boom. Boom. That's it. Fork my wife. Fork everybody. I'm going to do what this man says. And literally the next scene is, sorry, this is the final nail in the coffin. The secretary that he has not been sleeping with since he decided he actually wanted to be a husband had something else to be excited about in his like boring ass life. She's like, hey, I heard you got promoted. I guess your dad would have been real proud, huh? He's like, mm, daddy. <laughs> You're right. She's like, do you want to go get a drink or something? Mind you, this was written by a man. I don't think a woman would have written this. I'm not saying women don't do this. I'm just saying, I don't think she would have done this or needed to do this. This man was absolutely going to start forking her immediately as soon as he abandoned his soul his wife, everything, the whole dream. Of course he's 
deserve more than her. Men use women for everything. He's like, okay. <laughs> That's all it took. Meanwhile, she's all like trying to sell the house, has the passports, everything ready to go. And then we get to this scene. And he's like, what's up, bro? I haven't noticed uh, anything. He's like, what are you talking about? I don't pay attention to your emotional well-being ever. Why would I know? She's like, I'm pregnant! Now everything's gonna change. I'm sorry, my mic was not apparently working for the last 10 minutes. I'm actually gonna cut this off and do a part two. But Act three is intense and I just wanted to break this up a little bit. So stay tuned. Please comment. Please like. Please share. Do whatever. And I really love doing these things. But the only way these, these videos perform well is when people comment as much as possible and like and all that stuff. So please, um, if you like my movie breakdowns, give these a little extra love because it's more of a risk to do. So thank you very much and stay part for part two.